Crafting and Crime Daily. I'm Rebecca, your host, and I recap live trials. So you have something to listen to while you're out there crafting, making all those masterpieces. And if you want to show them off, you can put them in my Facebook group, Crafting Journey. All you have to do to join is answer a couple of questions. I'll let you in. You can show off your works in progress. I'd love to know what you're working on while you're listening. So Tad Daybell, day one is in the books and it brought back a lot of memories honestly to be honest with you i had not even thought about this case since Lori daybell was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole so the first witness that was on the stand after the opening statements and i did recap the opening statements um i'll put a link to that up here if you if you miss them um, they were both pretty short, like 20 minutes-ish for openings and closings, which in a case like this, they could have gone for hours, to be honest with you. But they kept it short and, and to the point. So the first person on the stand was a Detective Hermosillo. And he just walked the jury how, how he got involved in this case. And it was, it was very interesting to hear it told in the way it was the um, story, like, you know, from beginning to end. So he got involved in Idaho when he was contacted by the Gilbert police department. Now Gilbert police department is up in Arizona where Lori Daybell used to live. So they were contacted, they contacted uh, Detective Hermosillo and they said, you know, we've had an attempted murder up here that involves a Jeep Cherokee uh, that's linked to this address, which happened to be uh, Lori Vallow Daybell's apartment in Idaho. So they asked if this detective could uh, put some surveillance on this Jeep. If can you first, can you go find it? And secondly, if you do find it, can you just surveil it for us? And they're like, sure. So they go out and they start conducting surveillance out here. Now, this is all their, this is all they were tasked to do. They said it was involved in an attempted murder up in Gilbert. Um, I don't know if that's a city or a county, Gilbert Police Department. Uh, in any case, uh, up in Arizona. And this happened to do with Brandon Boudreaux. He came home. He is the nephew of Lori Vallow Daybell. He came home one afternoon and this Jeep was parked in front of his house. And he recognized the Jeep as being one that his, um, what would he be? What would she be? A cousin? His cousin? Anyway, Tylee Ryan, one of the missing children. She used to drive that Jeep. That was hers. So these, this officer, Hermosillo, he, they find the Jeep and they're looking out for it. So on November 4th of 2019, the Gilbert Police Department actually comes down to Idaho or goes up to Idaho, or is it across to Idaho? Geography is not my strong point. Anyway, they go to Idaho, they seize the Jeep, and at this point, um, they give these Hermosillo and the detectives a little bit more information. They're like, you know, and the, it, they really had trouble getting this in. The prosecutor did because the defense kept objecting to hearsay. But we do know, the jury now knows that grandma, which is Kay Woodcock, had been calling and wanted a welfare check done on J.J. Vallow because she had not seen her grandson in quite a while. So the Gilbert Police Department said, can you go do a welfare check? on on J.J. Vallow. And they're like, sure, we can do that. So uh, they go to this apartment complex. And when they get there, Chad Daybell and Alex Cox, which is Lori's brother, who's one of the co-conspirators. He's deceased, but he's a named co-conspirator. Alex and Chad are out standing by their vehicle. So Hermosillo goes over to them. And he's like, you know, we're looking for Lori Vallow because they had gone to her house 
her apartment, 175. No answer. So they're like, you know, we're trying to locate uh, Lori Vallow. And uh, they're like, oh, she's not home. Well, do you have her phone number? No, no, we don't. We don't. I don't have her phone number. Chad didn't have her phone number. Now, this officer, this detective already has been informed that Chad Daybell is her husband. <laughs> they just got married. Of course, he's got her phone number. But he said, no, I, I don't have her phone number. Neither did her brother. Don't have her phone number. Mm -hmm. So they he comes to find out that there's a couple of apartments. Like, there's three apartments that are being rented there. There was 107, which I think Chad was probably occupying. 174 was Melanie. Actually, 107 was probably being occupied by Alex. Chad lived in, this is all in Rexburg, Idaho. Chad lived with his wife, Tammy, in another part of town. <laughs> so, yeah, he just came over to be with his wife. Oh, this is so confusing. Yeah, <laughs> this whole thing is confusing because by now Tammy's done. But anyway. Okay, so he asked Chad and he asked Alex, have you seen the kids? No, no, we haven't seen the kids. No. So at this point in the testimony, they they offered JJ's birth certificate. He was born under a different name um, to parents that were drug addicted. They were all in the Vallow family. Uh, but then Charles Vallow and Lori adopted him and changed his name to J.J. Vallow. So the birth certificate is entered in to prove his age. And then um, this is all on November 25th of 2019 that they're starting to do these welfare checks. And Hermesio said when he approached Chad and Alec, they were acting very suspicious. So he would ask them a question and they would kind of look at each other first and then look at, you know, like, are we going to get our story straight? You know, weird, weird uh, interaction with that he had with them. So Lori, they said Lori wasn't home and when they went to the apartment, there was no answer uh, when they knocked on the door. So Chad's, uh, Chad and Alex said, oh, I think JJ's with his grandmother. And so this officer's like, well, that's highly unlikely since the grandmother's the one that made the, ask for the welfare check. So I don't think JJ's with the grandmother. So then they said, well, I think Lori's over in apartment 107 because the address that they had for her was apartment 175. So they go over to 107, um, knock on the door. They're not getting any answer. So um, initially they had not given him Lori's phone number, but after he called them out for their BS, they, they finally gave her, gave Hermesio Lori's phone number. So he calls Lori and of course, she doesn't answer. He leaves a voicemail. And then he heads to the police station because he's going to get a search warrant for these apartments to find. He says, you know, our priority was trying to find J.J. Vallow. You know, we're looking out for the wel welfare of J.J. Vallow. So he's headed to the police department to put together an affidavit in support of a search warrant for this property. On his way, he gets a phone call from Lori Vallow. Yes. And he says, well, you need to go answer your door. There's officers at your door right now. So, cause he sent them. So she goes and she answers the door and she lets them in, of course. So he go, turns around and goes back to the apartment properties and um, they, they do get a search warrant. They start searching those properties. So he said, it looked like when they searched, um, it look, the apartments all looked lived in except for 107. He said 107 was empty, nothing in it. But the other two apartments looked like they had been lived in. However, when he opened the closet door, it looked like somebody had just scooped up all the clothes, hangers and everything, and just left with them. There was nothing in the closet. 
underneath a crawl space under the stairs, he found a Star Wars backpack, only evidence of a child in that place. Uh, also, he found an old prescription model of JJ's. So Lori apparently mentioned at some point that they had a lot of stuff in a storage unit. That storage unit was also searched. So they found in apartment 174, which is the one Melanie Boudreaux was staying in. And by now she's got another name. She's staying, she's part of the whole cult thing. She, uh, they found a large amount of cash in her apartment and they seized it because the place was open. There was nobody around and they wanted to secure the money. They didn't want to leave it unsecure in the home. Okay. So they also found in the garage of Lori's apartment, a huge stash of weapons, handguns, knives, uh, rifles, yeah, a huge stash of weapons. So those were all seized. So at this point, this is November now, you know, late November, early December. And at this point, the scope of the search changes because now, because of some information, and we don't know what the information was because it's hearsay, but they added Tylee Ryan to the search because no one had seen Tylee Ryan in a long time. Now, Hermosillo, Detective Hermosillo said neither Chad nor Lori ever reported either of these children missing to anyone. Now, when it was determined that their scope of their search was now, in addition to Tylee, J.J. Vallow, it was included Tylee Ryan, he uploaded the missing person report to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children so that nationally they could take advantage of tips to see if anybody could find these kids. So they hold a press conference on November 20th looking for these kids. And I remember this, you know, that 2019, everybody around the entire country was looking for these kids. Where are these kids? So the next thing Hermosillo did, Detective Hermosillo, he goes to the court with an affidavit that he authored in support or uh, in his attempt to attain, obtain a court order ordering Lori Vallow to produce both of these children within five days of the warrant being served. But first he had to find them. Well, he finds them in Hawaii. So Detective Hermosillo gets a trip to Hawaii. He goes to Kauai. And uh, on January 5th, he is able to serve Lori Vallow Daybell with this order to produce her children within five days. Of course, we know her children were never produced within those five days. Lori in Hawaii is taken into custody. She is extradited back to um, are, are we in here? Idaho. She's extradited back to Idaho. Yes. It's not till later on, and I'm going to get to that, to the point where the defendant in this case is arrested. So the last known proof of life, which uh, was a photo of Tyler Ryan, was shown to the jury. It was a photograph taken on September 8th of 2019. It looked like they were at some kind of national forest. Uh, her uncle Alex was in the photo. Her mom was in the photo. And... I don't know if JJ was in the photo, but anyway, that's the last photo of her taken at 2.40 p.m. on September 8th. The last known proof of life for JJ Vallow was a picture of him sitting on the couch in that apartment, 175, on September 22nd of 2019 at 11.46 a.m. So it appears like Tylee may have been murdered first and then later on JJ. I don't know. So meanwhile, you know, all of this is going on. Hermosillo is focused on finding Tylee and JJ. Meanwhile, there is a concurrent search in Fremont County, which is the part of Idaho where Chad had lived with his wife, Tammy. There's a suspicious death investigation going on for Tammy Daybell. Now he said, I didn't get really, I, my focus was not Tammy Daybell. My focus was finding these kids. So um, someone else was in charge of 
the Tammy Daybell investigation. I'm sure we're going to hear all about that. Um, so on June 9th, we fast forward uh, after the break, we get to June 9th, uh, 2020, when Detective Hermosillo comes to, shows up at Chad Daybell's home at 7 a.m. with a whole army of people. He shows up with the evidence recovery team of the FBI, the ERT, FBI ERT, like blazing guns, knock, knock, knock. So Chad, and this is in Fremont County, on his four plus acre property. So Mark Daybell, one of the children of Chad and Tammy, answers the door. He's eating a bowl of cereal. And they're like, is your dad home? We have a search warrant. And he's like, uh, he's sleeping. I'll, I'll take you to him. <laughs> so he takes him in the house to, and shows him there's dad. He's sleeping. He was up in a loft and he's sleeping. So they go up and they, you know, Chad, Chad, we have a search warrant. We're going we're gonna to search your property. So they give him an opportunity to get dressed, call his lawyer. He calls the lawyer. The lawyer tells him to cooperate. And uh, he says, well, am I free to leave while this is going on? And they're like, uh, we'd rather you didn't go too far. So this, he says, well, I need to make some phone calls. So this Hermosillo follows him. He goes, I'm going to sit out in my truck out on the property. So he goes out and he's, Hermosillo goes with him and he's watching him make this phone call while he's sitting in the truck. And he says, he's got the phone up to his right ear and he keeps looking over his right shoulder. So he positions himself, Detective Hermosillo positions himself so he can figure out what is he looking at over his right shoulder. And he's looking at this area, this pond area where there's a tree. And it just so happens the ERT, the the FBI emergency or the FBI evidence recovery team at that same point in time had already begun their marking off areas, you know, where they're searching. And they had just finished marking off like this six by six area over by the tree. So <laughs> Chad sees this and, you know, and he's on the phone. So Hermosillo, after this, his job was, uh, he was assigned by the FBI. He's like, they said, you know, there's a fire pit over here. We'd like you to take these ashes and sift through the fire pit to see if you find anything. So he said he did that for about 45 minutes. And then they called for help over at the site by the tree and the pond. So he goes over there and they had marked off this six by six area. So the first thing they did was remove the topsoil from this area. It was kind of a dry soil. They, they removed it underneath. He says, as soon as they removed it, that topsoil, there were three large rocks, white rocks. And he said, as soon as that topsoil was gone, they started to smell the smell of decomposition, which he's familiar of from his work as a detective. So, and he said, the farther down they dug, the worst the smell got. So underneath the rocks was two thin pieces of wood. Once they removed that, there was a wet, moist soil underneath, and they began to see this black round object protruding through the dirt. So now they're, they're you know, anthropology, like going through sifting, you know, they're doing it very carefully at this point. And this black object is wrapped in plastic, black plastic. So uh, one of the FBI agents takes a knife and he cuts the plastic. And when he cuts the black plastic, underneath was some white plastic. So he cuts that and underneath that was brown hair, human hair. So it's about this time that they get notified that Alex, not, I keep wanting to say Alex, they get notified that Chad has fled. He, his daughter, I don't know, I don't know, he's got five kids, so I don't know who's what or, you know, who's on first, but she lives catty corner to him, very near to him, and he had been over her house 
So he leaves her house at high rate of speed. So they stop him and arrest him. And that's where we leave off for the day. <laughs> he was trying to get away. He's like, uh oh, they found him. So uh, uh, we're going to learn that that was J.J. Vallow that they found. And there were pictures shown to the jury. Now, I got to tell you, if you're trying to watch this live, it's difficult. It's very, very difficult because we're not getting a a professional news agency camera. You know, we're not getting court TV camera footage or long crime camera footage. We're getting the court's Zoom feed. Yes. So we've got the judge in one window. We've got the witness in a an, in an window down here. And over here, we've got the rest of the courtroom. And you can see Chad Dabel. He's like this little tiny speck. <laughs> so, and it's difficult. The, you know, they're not always using their microphones. The voices are muffled. And I always try to run it at a, a higher speed so I can get through the evidence to recap it for you. And it was very difficult because, you know, it's, you can't see the photos. They're showing it on a screen, but because of the lighting, you can't see any, you can't see the photo. Um, it's really just really poor camera work, but it's the court's camera feed. And that's, just, I mean, it's better than Lori's trial when we didn't get any camera feed. So I guess we have to like it or lump it, right? Anyway, I guess we'll uh, take what we can get, right? <laughs> so that's day one. So Hermesia will be back on the stand this morning when it starts, which should be any minute now. There is no court tomorrow in this case. Some pre-scheduling conflict. So the court will, will resume after today. Court will, will resume on Monday. So between now and Monday, I'm going to get you caught up on what transpires today on day two of testimony in Chad Daybell, and I will get you caught up on George Kelly's trial, the Arizona rancher. Yeah. What's going on with him? Day 11. Yes. All right. So have a wonderful day, everybody. See you later. Bye. Don't forget, leave me a comment. Yeah. Take care, everybody.